we have two amazing gentlemen who are building the products that we're all used to consuming. If you can do a quick poll, right? How many of us here have used the app PhonePay uh, sometime or the other? Yes, that's 90% and plus of the room. Um, how many of us have in some shape or form used JAR? Thank yes, you. not as many. So we do get the chance to use it after the session. Uh, but uh, the idea here is that in the next uh, 30 odd minutes, what we want to do is decode how fintech consumer apps are built and scaled across Bharat because it looks like uh, fintech has been this hyper competitive, uh, high CAC environment. Uh, however, these products have scaled across millions of users, across amazing geographies. And we want to decode that. So what you're going to listen from me is high CACs, uh, Bharat, uh, Tire 2 Plus very often through the chat as they give us insights to go deep. Uh, but maybe we'll start off with uh, Prashant. Uh, Prashant, I'd love to understand from you that, you know, this uh, savings, micro savings concept has been a very, like, instant behavior. However, digital savings is not a very common uh, behavior, right? So if you can maybe tell us how much uh, evangelism do you need to do to ensure that the, you know, tier 2 plus audience is familiar with this process and is actually then using it as well before we come to the acquisition bit, I think that'll be very interesting to hear. Uh, see, when it comes to evangelism, you have to kind of bifurcate the problem. Like, uh, are you evangelizing for the value proposition of saving as an act or mobile phone and the electronic payment as a medium? A I don't... Louder. Yeah. yeah. Am I audible? Yeah. So you have to kind of understand, dissect the problem. Like, we don't have to explain anybody the value of saving. What we need to explain and convince the people is that this is a more friction-free, more secure, and more reliable way of saving through mobile phone, through a payment gateway, so on and so forth. So yeah, the challenge lies basically winning the trust, getting the familiarity on the medium, not on the use case. It's like, are, are you trying to explore the... When Uber came along, they don't have to kind of... Uh, explain the value of transportation. They have to exp uh, explain the value of why Uber is a better medium of transportation than your regular taxi cab or car ownership and all. Got it, got it. That's fair. So you don't have to focus on the concept, but you have to focus on the mechanism of making it happen. Awesome, that's my takeaway. Um, to the second point in terms of phone pay, uh, she should be lovely if you can share uh, that, you know, phone pay does incredible amounts of volumes, right? However, staying close to the consumer is a concept that a lot of product leaders talk about. How do you incorporate uh, feedback when you are, you know, going across this consumer set? And also it feels like, uh, or at least the broad narrative is that the tier 2 plus audience is different from the tier 1 audience. So what are some interesting consumer insights that maybe you've grasped over the years of building phone play uh, to know that they are different from the tier 1 audience? Okay. I actually have a slightly contrary opinion. I don't think the tier to audience is different. I think they just exhibit this, the same needs in different ways. And let me try and explain a little bit what I mean by that. Uh, much like what Prashant was saying, you don't need to explain savings to people. You need to show them an easier, convenient method to do this at the tip of their fingertips, right? Digital payments is a similar problem, right? Cash was king and still continues to be, in some senses, a majority mode. But digital payments continues to be one of those mechanisms which has built in more and more convenience over a window of time. Now, as for your question about uh, true user fragmentation, because we're present across many hundreds of millions of users, the way we, I mean, I'll sort of break the answer into two parts, which is, uh, you know, how, what is our, like, sort of high-level process as to how we incorporate this? And the second one is, how do we actually plan for it actively, right? As far as planning is concerned, I think, uh, one of the things we as a product team actively work on uh, uh, in terms of staying close to customers is to actually try and, I mean, we have a lot of employees obviously, but uh, you can actually see digital payments pretty much being ubiquitous everywhere at this point in time, right? All the way, uh, you know, from really, really small towns to urban cities, right? Um, in some senses, what happens is that I think once, uh, and you know, platform, I mean, networks like UPI are such magical ones that you can actually see really, really, really sort of easy, convenient ways to do this, even in low network situations, right? So uh, what tends to happen is that it, it happens around you, right? And if you take a poll around the audience, payment failures is common, low network areas are common, phones conking off is common, right? Like, there are a lot of scenarios where payment, I mean, to put very simply, needs to compete with cash uh, uh, in terms of reliability. And it really helps that because it's so ubiquitous, uh, 
it's just ingrained into us as consumers as well as builders, right? Uh, and we have a lot of field, field, field force teams and stuff like that that actually acquire a lot of smaller merchants for payments. So we get a ton of feedback from the ground as well, right? So we've got a lot of these channels of feedback. I mean, like you rightly said, when we are processing many billions of transactions, even a 0.1 of 0.1 person gives you a ton of feedback, right? You just have to be willing to listen to it. It can be on reviews, it can be on customer support channels, it can be on social channels and stuff like that. Now, as far as our ability to actually do something about it, uh, we are sort of very cognizant of a lot of these challenges, right? Uh, especially given the device fragmentation in this country. So what we normally end up doing is that we move a lot of logic to the mobile device, we try and do it on the edge, we try and ensure that there are ways in which we can get as much work done without the internet being present, works on extremely, extremely low latency environments, right? So we, you have to plan for it. Like, it's, it's not as though... Uh, one of the big problems that often happens when you build products is you think of the app as this glorified mechanism to just show what you want to show. Uh, it doesn't work like that. It's an overall interface where you have to actively plan for it, right? Um, for example, today on the phone pay app, uh, and you can give it a, a shot, many of our major flows, till you initiate a payment, you can get through without the internet, right? Um, so you can actually experience this on that, right? So you have to, like, really, really sort of, in some sense, culturalize it uh, as part of the teams. And I mean, we've been doing this for many years now, but that's, I mean, uh, an insight into how we do it. I would like to add something to that. Like he rightfully, rightly mentioned that there are technical challenge, infrastructure challenge, interface challenge and all. And by very nature, payment is such a nuanced activity, which is kind of so much tightly woven in the cultural context. Nothing but time can solve those problems. Just to give you an example, today in Bangalore, I can go for a morning walk and have a cup of coffee by making a payment through UPI, phone pay. Back in my hometown, it's very hard because there is a stigma of not getting first payment in the morning in cash. The shopkeeper always want that first payment in the morning, Bonnie, should be in the cash. So now that generational problem, only a generational shift will take care of it. In the same way you look at, uh, I, I used to work for Paytm, uh, like, uh, and we used to see this thing where the same person, uh, young, we used to run these campaigns and we used to saw like, uh, the same person is making a lot of QR code payment, online payment recharge and all, but for some strange reason, when it comes to ordering a shoe, no matter how much of discount you give, they will do a COD. And we tried every trick known to us, and later on when we call these guys and ask, they say, Ki, because I have a fixed pocket money, when I do a COD, my mom takes the delivery, it doesn't come into my pocket money. So now that's a, not a technology problem, that's a societal problem. Uh, so adaptation will take time. People have some deep-rooted habit has to change and that cannot possibly be done overnight. But you know, interestingly, just on Boni, uh, I know we understand the concept. We've seen a lot of the next generation of people who are taking over family businesses, people who are in their 20s and stuff, take digital bonies now. So you can talk about generational shifts starting to occur, right? It's, it's kind of uh, fantastic. You should do boni cashback. <laughs> Don't tempt us, sir. <laughs> uh, no, but these are super insights, right? Like talks about how fast the transformation in terms of digital is happening. And also I think what I'll take back is like tire two, tire one is not different. Just the expression of the same needs is exemplified in a different way. So I think that was super interesting. Um, but maybe let's address the elephant in the room, right? Uh, what at least looks like from a consumer fintech standpoint is that there is a lot of competition, right? When we talk about, let's say, payments, right? Uh, there's Paytm, Google Pay, Phone Pay. Phone Pay is leading the market when it comes to UPI. You now have multiple products, but uh, CACs, as they say, are super high when you're trying to expand, right? Uh, and then the counter narrative is that our pose uh, in tier two uh, is very low, right? Talk to us, maybe, you know, I'll start with Sheesh this time. Uh, about how do you navigate this problem statement, right? Like, how do you sustainably grow, uh, ensure that you're scaling while you're being able to draw revenues as well and that it's not very vanity in nature? Understood. Uh, 
Great question. I think, uh, uh, I mean, the CAC and ARPU conversation is the classic long-term revenue and long-term cost conversation, right? Uh, and I think Prashant may have observed this at his time as Paytm, right? I think a lot of the digital payment uh, applications when they started out, um, maybe spent a fair degree of money getting the initial set of distribution. Uh, but to put very simply, there's no other winner than making a good product, right? Uh, which means that you need to be, I mean, it sounds very old school when I say it, but your first 100 users will get you your next million in some sense, right? Um, and, and that is at the heart of everything that we do. When we speak about making stuff work in like re really, really fragmented devices and stuff like that, there's no better way to acquire that than getting your first set of promoters, right? I know there's this like sort of... Uh, uh, blitz scaling and like a lot of those terms that get thrown around hoping that you can hope capital plays away. Uh, but uh, like he said, I think you cannot change behavior overnight, right? Like it needs to be inculcated, tried and stuff, right? So that's one in terms of just shaping behavior. Now the cost of doing this, which is CAC, uh, you got to be a little smart about this. There's enough examples in the fintech industry which have tried to scale through capital. There are enough people who have tried to scale organically and there are winning examples in both, right? Uh, you need to know uh, where to spend and what kinds of things to spend on to. Uh, and that's a learning curve for every business. Unfortunately, I can't give a silver bullet answer to that, right? Uh, as far as the APUs are concerned in tier two, tier three, uh, I think th the way at least you articulated the question, uh, it felt like, uh, let's say there's X and let's say Y being available as CAC and ARPU for uh, tier one, is that X by two and Y by two, right? Uh, I mean, being super reductive, but like that's the kind of math. I actually don't think it works linearly like that in some sense. Um, Tier 2 and Tier 3 is this sort of catch-all phrase that a lot of people use to talk about low-income audience, right? Uh, in some senses, there's a lot of urban low-income and there's a lot of rural high-income too, right? And you will be quite surprised as to how much cash dominates some of these economies and how there is a lot of like sort of stated and unstated wealth that exists over there, right? So um, that is number one. But let's assume on averages you're right, right? Like being extremely, uh, uh, you know, sort of uh, aggregated. Uh, as long as you can keep your cost in play, you can make your ARPUs work, right? See, at the heart of it, the math works as long as you can get enough people to use it or enough turns, right? We've observed in PhonePay that uh, at the heart of it, the larger the network, the higher the chance that you'll be able to monetize it effectively, right? So uh, there's no shortcut to it. Um, there is no, I can't come and tell you, guess what guys, like you're at X CAC today, maybe you'll get to 2X in three years and you'll still make it work. The absolute uh, like sort of like economic answer is no, you can't. Right. Um, so, but I do want to uh, land one final fact that I think uh, this notion that, you know, can you not make businesses work in what we sort of uh, uh, mention as Bharat? I don't think that's true. I think India has proven many, many times over, at least you can get product market fit in some sense. Monetizability, you can see so many interesting models coming up in content spaces, right? That's a great example of savings, right? Which means that you can actually build micro habits uh, where there's not enough money, right? So you just have to put on your thinking hats, right? And like you said, the need is not different. It's just stated differently, right? So you got to stay true to that. Yeah, no, absolutely. I think both of you on stage are a testification of the fact that, you know, Bharat is growing and Bharat will yield and use these products. It's just a matter of time as to how revenues get driven. Um, the room is a bit uh, silent in nature. Too, so very quickly before the next question, we'll do a poll, right? Um, when it comes to... Please, please, please. Prashant, add. Uh, I disagree with the premise that uh, CAC is high. Okay. It's like the time frame you look at and then there are certain structural reason like uh, first of all why cac is not high i am a 90s kid i seen the cost of acquisition for paypal 10 dollar per sign up for next 10 referral you used to get 10 dollar roughly as a independent paypal user you can get up to 120 or 150 dollar in your account just by having an account and referring your friend that was their cac at a user base of 10 million use case of p2p you adjust it for inflation we are talking somewhere 5000 right what the cac for if you're trying to sell a high end shoe customer for mantra 2000 still adjusted for inflation if you look at the long-term LTV into the picture, I think our CACs are very reasonable. It's just that we don't do that. This is a horizontal company. 
you acquire a customer for recharge, gold, anything, you can sell 110 other use cases in addition to P2P. So LTV has to be seen, but people are skeptic. That's one. Other reason is, I believe CACs are artificially inflated. Name one ad network who can give 100% guarantee that whatever I claim to be tier two customer is actually tier two customer. They sell the same customer to a luxury marketer saying he's a tier one guy. Same cookie map to tier one and tier two both. And at that time they don't reduce the CAC. This is all inflated. Okay. If they actually try to segregate based on IP or cookie or mobile number or circle ID, uh, a lot of, I don't have to worry much, but a lot of ad industries economics will be in question. So that inflated is very much artificial inflation. The day these guys start because they have merchant level data, they can easily decide that this guy is transacting at this merchant in Agra, I can give you a better targeting. I'll see how many people will go to traditional media driven ad properties. You know, so that inflated is not by choice or not because the customer acquisition cost is high because there is a fat markup. They should be worried. But yeah, I kind of, uh, I mean, uh, to sort of add on, right? The math about LTV is so exact, inexact in its sense, right? It's, I mean, I mean, anybody who believes that uh, LTV uh, is sort of a real, like, like, very, very practical concept uh, needs to probably recalibrate in some sense, right? Because what it really means is that, uh, to put in reductive mathematical terms, it's retention times whatever is the yearly ARPU in some sense, right? And ARPU is ARPU. Like, it, it will play out, right? I mean, you're in the economy, you're with the economy. So you can't suddenly say, oh, my user has got, let's say, I don't know, 100 rupees ARPU in a year. Next year, I'll go to 120. That ain't going to happen suddenly at the drop of a hat. What you should be instead focusing on is having like massively retentive numbers, right? Like I'm talking about north of 99% retention, if I can call it that, right? Because I think that's the only true way in which you can hang on to customers and continue to serve them well, while having the optionality of giving them more and more services and monetizing them, right? Uh, if you ever do the LTV math, you will realize that if you get in, in an example that he took, which is e-commerce, I would be very surprised if you acquire it, let's say 1500 bucks, you can't recover that in some sense, right? At an average order value of 2000, 3000 rupees. Assuming you keep like a, a large enough chunk, right? Over let's say 10 purchases. And if, if you cannot spur 10 purchases over lifetime, then we have a problem as a product, honestly, right? And that's at the heart of this problem. Um, does the fact that there are too many players and too much capital being driven on marketing inflate CACs as well? Because you're fighting for the same mind share. You're fighting for the same wallet share. Yet there are there is more capital being thrown by different companies. No. Can you elaborate? Yeah, I don't think there is an excess of capital. It's a marketplace for users. You will always have overinflation, right? I mean, let me put it like this. If uh, there were some people in the room and you ran an auction, you will see infl un like inflated prices come in at same point or time. I think the smart guy bids properly. It's the classic IPL problem, right? And that's exactly what it comes down to. You need to know which customer you're serving and when you're serving them, right? I think it's a little foolhardy to think that somehow you can shape behavior and then lament about the fact that it's very expensive. Can't have it both ways, right? Yeah. Got it. Um, but, uh, you know, coming to Prashant, maybe, to the previous trail of questioning, right? Uh, when we're talking about, let's say, multiple, let's say, savings products, right? Uh, there is something in, let's say, uh, you know, let's say, public equity. There's something in mutual funds. There's something in uh, the asset class that you're trying to do. How do you ensure that for your sort of asset class, and as he was mentioning, retention is super high. They keep coming back to you, and with over a period of time, you have maybe multiple products. How do you ensure that retention loop is very strong while you're taking care of growth as well? As a product team, how much amount of time are you spending in, you know, let's say retention on a more tactical level, vis-a-vis, -vis, let's say, growth opportunities, expanding the suit of products that you have, et cetera? I mean, uh we look at retention in two ways. One is essentially the time spent that person should be engaged. And then like how much of cross sell happens. Now that time spent engagement is essentially mostly a challenge in terms of recurring value prop, you know? So why should somebody do this activity again and again? And then you have to basically address uh, basically practice a lot of constraint because you would like that somebody should wake up and first thing he should open your app. N not gonna happen. 
okay you are not instagram but while somebody having a smoke after his lunch now you have a fighting chance between instagram and a fintech app let's say one of those bucket of context which i emerged during the course of the day not many people have understanding of that that's first thing other is that when it comes to cross selling and not taking uh, promoting one feature at the cost of other you know the cannibalization and all and uh, that if that's happening basically if there is something wrong in your either cohort division or your basic understanding of the value you are giving or how you communicate with the user like uh, how, how many people think that there is a uh, i give you one stat there are more bitcoin users unique bitcoin buyer in india than credit card users why ask yourself people say that credit card or dmat account is the cap ceiling of mutual fund market who says so why can't you start seeing let's say somebody who is playing this fantasy game as a potential user of mutual fund there's a basket of activities there's a electronic payment you are hedging on a probability this is basically same construct applied on something else but our mental model is stuck that enabler for this is only somebody who have a credit card or a dmat account and that's the subs my mutual fund user will always be a subset of that that's not the case you can buy mutual fund for like uh, in a, you can sell mutual fund to a lot of people if you understand what's the underlying mechanism is ye uh, copy paste nahi chalta beyond a point got it got it that's fair before we go to the next questions maybe we take a quick poll in the room as to how the room is investing since we were on you know investing products etc so if you had to ask like if your majority assets are in fds raise your hand nobody in the room um if your majority assets are in public equities raise your hand okay uh if your majority assets are in gold raise your hand okay couple of hands in the room and if your majority assets are in mutual funds sips raise your hands okay so we have mutual funds sips winning um coming to you shish maybe uh before we sort of you know we are sort of in the concluding aspect so we want to make this as collaborative as possible if we have time we'll come to you for questions but now phone pay has these you know suite of products that we're seeing right there's a bunch of launches coming i mean it looks like you know your the standard sort of product lens or a, the vc lens to building enough distribution then expanding verticals to get uh, enough revenues driving right how do you as a product leader uh, internally prioritize where the road map is shaping right like is it uh, too much on let's say growth is it too much on diversification of products is it too much on again expansion retention etc how do you as a product leader internally um, manage this see i think a lot of product building uh, in today's day and age in the country um, gets articulated as uh, six month problems one year problems three month problems and stuff like that no product has ever been built like that uh, and at least software right touch wood i have not had seen that issue but uh, i think we're really really talking about 5 10 year horizons right as as far as things are concerned now as long as you can be intellectually honest about how you're setting that goal post suddenly the time doesn't concern you as much anymore uh, and i'm also a strong believer in the fact that uh, i i've heard some young product leaders often come and say my focus area for this quarter is acquisition and my focus area for the next quarter is retention and then the next quarter after that is monetization matlab it's not like a train where you have like a coupe after coupe right like you will actually have a lot of situations where you will have to find a balance right fact of the matter today is that all of us are uh, you know part of businesses right which means that whatever is the capital that's being uh, pumped into a lot of these businesses you need to give commensurate returns right now you will find the best path that works for you at least in in um, our situation what we've seen is that we've had a razor sharp focus on the long run and the goal post what that has meant is that we've never had to or do we want to 
make this trade off in this kind of a reductive manner right uh, to to maybe articulate it differently it's not like we blindly look for distribution and then somehow say that you know we will go ahead and build a lot of these different uh, product lines for monetization the right way to articulate it is did you give a reason for the customer to get your product initially did you add more and more value over the long run for them to continue using you for the uh, foreseeable future right the monetizability will come naturally as an extension of that right it's a very input driven way to think about it often times we will say oh revenue is focused for the quarter so you know what i'm okay losing some users kind of like sort of subtext comes in i have not met any ceo or head of product ever come and say i'm okay losing 10% of my users if i can make 20% more revenue i mean you should correct me if i am wrong right so, so you're saying diversification is forward looking and not backward it always is right see i think there's two kinds of diversification right there's the absolute uh, must that you need to give as a uh, a product whatever your product line is if it's e-commerce if it's fintech it doesn't matter which is what customers may in some sense implicitly expect out of you and is very much needed for hygiene and uh, completion then there is a lot of interesting diversification that we are starting to see which is outside of the uh, realm of what is regular hygiene right uh, there's a lot of payment companies that have tried to do this uh, in some shape and form across sort of what i call as slightly oblique sectors right but usually that's really how this pans out right because there's also the added complexity that while we may think that product management is or oh, right code somehow get distribution there's a dna needed in the company to run these businesses right and that development is not going to happen overnight we ourselves in our business because we've sort of gone from uh, starting as a payment player to a sort of a full stack financial services company the dna needed to make a lot of these products and businesses work is vastly different right so you have to stay true to that problem like uh, i'm not a believer that distribution comes first and then somehow magically something else will happen later one thing uh, i would like to have, you know often time earlier we used to uh, whenever we meet somebody we used to see how many apps are installed on your phone like you know i think that's the symptomatic of the problem because what you are chasing is the wallet share not the device screen so if you look at the sms data of somebody you can easily say this guy is actually somewhere doing a like mutual fund purchase he has a running em emi for housing loan he has some kind of a sip running and all then you know for me the challenge is not to introduce but to switch if fintech start only focusing on switching the customer from the traditional agent to the native there is a opportunity lying there what you are going after is the wallet share if somebody hasn't allocated that slice of his income to let's say mutual fund selling he might be a very lucrative customer but selling him will be slightly more difficult it will be it will take some iteration to figure out got it awesome no those are very interesting insights it's not about you know just looking at diversification or like expansion and isolation It has to be more forward looking in the road map needs to be set from scratch um so that's interesting real estate investing how do fintech plan to incorporate that and increase that wallet share because a lot of indians actually primarily invest in real estate so we have three questions no, no. Uh, and the corollary is how do you ex uh, plan to take money pe from people's hand which is going into real estate into these uh, other products got it perfect so we have three questions one is on you plan for that one is on the statement that you had made and the other is on real estate and how do you take that you know investment uh, wallet share to other asset classes feel free to take the ones you'd like uh, i can take the regulatory one uh, we are in a bunch of regulated businesses see i think uh, often times uh, when regulators come up with circulars or certain guidelines right um, <laughs> there is this narrative that somehow there's somehow uh, you know making life a kind of not easy to operate in right and uh, sometimes people tend to forget the spirit of that that regulation right like why did even come with right uh, you look at a lot of the uh, sectors right like you can look at all of the government bodies i think it's very important to realize that when you're building a lot of these businesses right you need to understand the spirit of what they're saying right uh, we've seen a lot of uh, scenarios in the last i want to say 3 to 4 years where there's a lot of sectors where a lot of uh, i want to say very interesting but shaky business models and product models have come into the picture right uh, and 
I would like to believe at this point in time that the people who started doing this knew in some sense what was happening and were operating in areas that were a little uncertain, right? You got to be a little like sort of honest about the fact that they are doing it and then not get surprised about the fact that someone came calling uh, at that point in time, right? I have never seen a regulator who's trying to out to get you just for the sake of it, like, right? It usually is the fact that the, the regulator is actually trying to protect us as consumers and customers, right? As long as you can be sure about the value that you are delivering genuinely, I've also seen very, very interesting scenarios where they've engaged with industry actively, right? In order to be able to shape that narrative very well, right? So, uh, it's, I think in some sense, uh, you know, requires a little bit of a mature mindset because I, a lot of the younger founders are sort of impatient to build good stuff, right? And rightly so. But when you are building in financial technology, you got to realize you're touching people's money day in, day out, right? And you shouldn't be surprised that, that someone's actually keeping you honest on that one, right? So I think it's important to like be very, very honest about what's the value you're adding and how are you adding it, right? And truly engage with the spirit of what's being told, right? And I know it's probably not like it's a little bit of an abstract answer, but I'm hoping it gives you a sense of how not to, let's say, maybe think of it in binary terms, right? I mean, yeah, unless you are very big, regulator will not look at you. Unless you are doing something very shady, they will not look at you. And I don't think that both is the case with you. I hope not the second one. Yeah. Sure. Do you want to address the second question as well? Yeah, I think it was a question on a niche and I'll let Prashant talk about it because I think he's closer to the problem in some sense, right? But uh, to answer your question, see, uh, the customer definition changed the way you articulated it, right? What I mean by that is that if you're serving 100 customers at a particular price point, if you upped your price point or you changed your offering, it's fair to assume that in some sense that that product changed, which means that the customer changed too, right? Now, my statement was in the context of a lot of software platform products, right? What it practically means is that with that offering at that price point for that customer, you didn't have an offering. More often than not, you see this across a lot of large manufacturing brands and you see this across a lot of consumer durable goods. People will find alternate offerings, right? You see this all the time in conglomerates, right? You are offering something and I mean fashion for that matter. There's a reason why the brand split up, right? Just to ensure that across the portfolio, they're able to serve a variety of customers, right? I think that's practically what will end up happening. It, I, I can't think of a situation where the same product, you've changed your offering, and by the way, a price change is a change in offering, whether people will agree to it or not, is a change in the customer that you're serving, right? So you got to, like, it's a full, like, uh, fully quotable uh, market, right, that you're talking about. You, I think it is a little difficult to say that, like, operate in the niche and, you know, by the way, you're holding on to it even though you can't serve him. I don't think it works like that. But, and what I'm surprised and really curious to know is where is the lock-in for the customer? But what is the switching cost for customer? I mean, you have taken the online travel agent segment, payment segment, for slight cashback, they switch loyalties. So where is what's stopping customer if you have a better value proposition? So we can't really hold, hold uh, a customer from going to... Uh, competition if there's genuinely a better uh, product sitting there. Yeah, so I think, I don't agree with the premise that someone I hope it answers the question. I know it's a little difficult to hear you to begin with. Yeah? Uh, I mean, see, uh, Fintech is still about fintech, you know. A real estate is a considered lifelong purchase, right? So it will be an overkill to think that people will like buy a house. They might buy housing loan. And in that too, you might get lead generation, not like full service and all. Uh, so I don't think that's a battle for fintech. Real estate itself has a their own problem to solve and uh, you let them deal with it first. I am happy doing lead generation for them if they come to me because uh, the whole dynamics, the engagement, iteration, uh, anybody who has bought a house knows and do you really want to get into owning that customer and then like you know 
that's the tragedy if you look at it like you know it's the most expensive and the most critical purchase in a person's life and the reliability of builders and all are not that great so i will be very very cautious before touching that sector also just to add one more thing i think real estate in some sense is an asset backed activity which is a physical real asset right uh i mean i may be extremely presumptive but if i was to like sort of grade what is underserved markets and overserved markets i think real estate falls squarely in a relatively well served market right the banking and the financial services industry even if it is in physical outlets have served these segments relatively well for a very long period of time right i think we have to be also honest about the fact that technology is is an enabler right it's it's, it's not an end in itself if for whatever reason there is some kind of uh, efficiencies of cost or uh, efficiencies of distribution that these uh, technology platforms can bring in then i i'm sure someone's going to come in right but you also have to be honest about the fact that like he said the price point is so massively high and the purchase is so curated and extremely extremely like uh, carefully made you have to be sh- like sure whether technology has a role to play there really beyond a point right any other Got it. i think that answers uh, all questions um uh, this we are also done with time but what we'll do is since we you know live in a world with instant gratification we'll end with just very two quick questions that summarize broadly what we've discussed one is on you know if you had to share learnings from a product leader standpoint to what do you look for in product talent if you can summarize some of the top characteristics and the second is when scaling across tier 2 and beyond what are some key learnings to keep in mind as a summary i think that'll be a great way to end the panel okay so two questions what do we look for in uh, great product leaders and uh, while building products what do i get careful about in tier 2 i think those are the two okay see as far as product talent is concerned i think uh, we've got all of the classic ones and i mean i'm actually very curious how many people have tried interviewing for a product role ever okay good so okay so you know the torture that people get put through in some sense uh there's of course a lot of the uh, the classical functional stuff which is problem solving ability ability to abstract look back scale uh, understand software when needed right understand bounds of it right and there's no substitute for it i'm not trying to downplay that but the one thing we really really look for in product leaders at least i personally had relative success with is two things right the intellectual honesty to actively admit what you know and what you don't know right and secondly the hunger and the curiosity to actively put in the hours and hours of investment to be able to develop the skills needed to really really scale up further and further right i i mean it's sort of at the heart of most jobs but it, it that inherent curiosity is what really drives a lot of uh, product building and product learning right and uh, you can see this right you can see people in some senses use jargon that they don't necessarily understand potentially trying to uh, impress us with uh, frameworks that we may or may not necessarily agree with and right like i i don't think people need to put in a lot of effort to make it look like you know they know a framework before they can apply it in some sense there is a reason for that so how many mbas there how many mbas uh, yeah, yeah. so tell you what happens is that a lot of the people who gravitate toward like uh, product as a function I don't know how many of them want to build product or they are running away from sales ka target and engineering ka code. Most of them come to product because they think yeah, I don't have to write code and I don't have to chase target. Uh, and on top of that what happens is when you go into MBA there is a filter which is called group discussion where whether you are contributing anything to the conversation is secondary you should speak. and when this janta comes into the product they re- have to speak something because that's what they are trained for whether they are adding to the knowledge pool becomes a totally orthogonal so you see lot of this jargon coming essentially because that's the filtering criteria they've been through genuine what he's saying is like very not a small problem it's a big problem because we don't we are not willing to admit that our ignorance of the tier 2 people most of us for us the tier 2 is either my kamwali or my driver or the guy i met during uber 
most of us have stopped talking to the classmates of 9th, 10th who didn't went to engineering or MBA. That is tier 2, tier 3. And the handling of ambiguity is at the heart of everything, like he said, no. right? If you cannot agree that you don't know something, mm -hmm. then in some sense, you cannot handle the fact that it's ambiguous as a problem space, right? Which means there is no way in which you can be true to the problem space and creatively build solutions, right? It's extremely difficult in that sense, right? Yeah. Okay. Enough, uh, I think, pontification, I suppose. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I mean, it's, it's a big problem, actually, because uh, we have this very patronizing attitude toward NBU. Okay, you know, this is an NBU property. I can show pop-ups to my heart's content. Give me a break. See, WhatsApp for all time and eternity has proven that same interface space can serve an NBU rickshaw wala and a CEO of a multi-million dollar company. So if you are saying there is more cognitive ability required, you are mistaken. WhatsApp has proven it for eternity. Same interface is serving. They don't even do tooltip. They don't even tell you ki we have launched a new feature and everybody picks it up. The challenge is on us to figure out how to build that. And the other thing is that this whole patronization has to stop. There is immense purchasing power. There is immense sophistication lying there. There is, I tell you, it's just, if you treat your customer with respect, you will learn, like, ever wondered, like, why TikTok was more popular in tier 2, tier 3 first, and then it became a urban tier 1 phenomena? Any guess? And when the whole India was, like, gravitating on TikTok, it was pulled away, None of the Indian company was beneficiary of that switch. Why the entire TikTok India traffic went to Instagram? Precisely because of this patronizing attitude. Basic fundamental. TikTok works because video overcomes the literacy barrier on the consumption side and voice overcomes the literacy barrier on the creation side. Semi-literate or people are there, they are using the product. You build it, they will come. How many of us are doing? So I can go on, like, I'll stop. Yeah, no, but uh, this has been very helpful. I think uh, if there are any further questions, the speakers are going to be around after the session as well. So feel free to take it offline. But this has been an absolute pleasure. Can we have a huge round of applause for the speakers? Thank you so much for your insights and thank you for being a great audience. Web Engage. Retention simplified.